Well, that was quite a tour de force and a tour of the world. And we can see why there are 900 people here based on what Amit has done. It's quite a tough act to follow, but I'll give it a try. My name is Julie Katzman, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer and the Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank, the largest provider of development finance in Latin America and the Caribbean. This year, we'll lend about $15 billion in the region, which sounds like a lot of money, but you have to put it in context. The region needs $100 million just to repair existing hospitals. And obviously, the needs are much greater than that. There's a need for additional medical infrastructure and the people who make those buildings and hospitals run. The need for educational facilities, better teacher training, more and better teachers. And I could go on and on. And that compares to $150 billion that was lent globally by all of the international financial institutions around the world. So clearly, there's a need for big partners. And partners not just for their money, but partners because they bring capabilities and expertise that allow you to go after big and complicated challenges. So for example, what would you need if you were going to rob the biggest casino in Vegas? <laughs> You'd need a team of really committed and capable individuals. You'd need a team of really capable and committed individuals who bring to the table a specific set of skills all working together. Or perhaps, even more complicated, what would you need if you wanted to be the first country in the world to win the Cricket World Cup at home? Well, don't take my word for it. Let's see what the captain of the team said. That victory was built on team unity and togetherness. So what do those two seemingly disparate examples have in common? A focus on team, on partners, the capabilities that they bring together to the table and a laser-like focus on the outcomes that they were after. That translates well into the 2030 agenda, where we need government to focus on bringing new private sector partners to the table, not just for their financial resources and their financial capital, but for their managerial capital and their innovation capital. And we need them to get much more focused on outcomes so that we have smarter government, more agile government, tech-enabled government, government that's better measured, which equals more efficient government. And now we have financial instruments that can help them achieve both of those things. So let's look first at a social impact bond where we've got community that has a challenge. We've got government that's willing to prioritize that challenge and has an outcomes mindset. We've got service providers who've got innovative options for solving that problem. And we've got investors who are willing to put up the working capital that can finance those service providers. We've got a project manager to pull it all together and an evaluator to tell us how well that service provider does. And then we get to the end and if they've done a good job, we've got government, multilaterals and bilaterals who will provide outcomes payments to provide a return to those investors. Why does all of that matter? Because the community only benefits if those outcomes are achieved. And governments today have amazingly constrained budgets. Fiscal constraint is a norm throughout the world. And investors are now being able to see the impact that they can deliver while getting a return. And these are exactly the things that we saw in the social impact bond that we did about 18 months ago in Colombia. That bond was focused on employment and training to, lie to vulnerable populations, many of whom had been displaced from internal conflict. And what we saw was really good performance. In fact, in fact performance better than the traditional models attacking employment and training situations. The results were better whether you looked at graduation rates or you looked at job placement rates and when you looked at cost. And let's look a little bit more deeply there. 
You know, typically when you do these kinds of training and employment programs, government looks at the overall cost and how many people were trained. So let's say it was $100,000 and 500 people, $200 a person. But is that really the cost? Is that really what we're aiming for? A typical success percentage is that 50% of those people trained actually get jobs. Well, then the cost is $400 for what we're actually trying to achieve for that outcome. But let's not stop there. Let's think about what we really want, which is durable employment, resilient employment. So let's look at how many of those people have jobs three months from now or six months from now. And again, that's probably 50%. So the cost is $800 per person for the outcome you want. But if you walk into a government office and you say, hey, I've got a training program and it costs $800 a person, they're not likely to pay much attention. Why? And that's what popped out of this experience. First, the government and the service providers got really focused really fast on those outcomes and on breaking down any of the bottlenecks that were in place to prohibit their reaching them. But second, the government now started to see that they didn't actually know what the costs of these programs were because they didn't have the outcomes. They didn't have the data. And now they've engaged in a pilot to start looking at costs differently and to get that data so they can drive better decision making in the future. Third, we saw a really broad range in the capabilities and what was delivered by the service providers. Some were good at one thing, some were good at another. After three months, some had twice the job insertion rate as others. The learning community that was created around that made all of them stronger. And fourth, the transparency of those results. It changed the definition of success from one of compliance to one of performance. And it started to create a marketplace for what those outcomes actually cost. So, what does all this mean for impact and public money, the topic of this talk? Well, what we see is it's hard to transfer and translate budgets toward pay-for-success models. In the eight years of the Obama administration and after a great deal of focus, less than 1% of the federal budget was moved toward pay-for-success models. Why is it so hard? It's not a lack of capability. There are civil servants all over the world who are very capable. And it's not that it's so difficult. I mean, everybody here in a few short minutes gets the basic sense. And we know that it really does make sense. Well, we see this as an issue of incentives and culture. Things like the inflexibility of government budgets and procurement processes. The fact that most government ministries want to spend 100% of what they got allocated that year in the budget and not look at really how efficient was that spending and what was the outcome achieved. It's the silos in government and it's the lack of space for innovation. SIBs and DIBs address many of those challenges, but they've got limitations. They tend to be one-off, bespoke, relatively small, with relatively high transaction costs, negotiating costs, and time costs. So we need more. We need the full continuum of instruments that can work on a pay-for-success model, on an outcomes basis, from SIBs and DIBs to do exploration and learning, to outcomes funds, which have been mentioned earlier today, whether they're regional or global or sectoral, to other kinds of contracting on a pay-for-success model. They can help change culture and incentives toward pay for success and outcome spending across government and development finance. So the government can be more adaptive, more accountable, and more user oriented. So imagine this, that there's in a first step, a unit of government that focuses on promoting pay for success models. It works across government in multi-dimensional problems, breaking down those silos. It encourages experimentation and innovation. It conceives of ways to have ministries contribute to outcomes payments. It attracts entrepreneurs and businesses to the social sector. And it promotes marketplaces of outcomes. And that leads to people across government becoming fluent 
in all of the outcomes instruments. And it revolutionizes how government spends money and the impact that that money has so that everyone benefits from the individual mayor who decides to go after an innovative model to the investors and the service providers, to the individual who gets a job or stays out of jail, to society as a whole who sees an in increase in productivity and the economic pie expanding. That's the road that we're on with Colombia and a number of other governments in the region. That's the road that brings us to that tipping point. And that's the road that we hope all of you and all of the other governments in our region will join us on. Thank you.